My name is Elle, and I'm a transgender woman talking about therapy. Um, I uh, recommend therapy. Um, you know, for many years, I was a pastor, um, like you've heard me say, and um, it was interesting. The churches that I was a part of um, didn't always have uh, the best relationships with therapy as a field, and you know, I kind of feel like in general, that may be true of more conservative religions, you know, and I, I feel like that there's commonly this perspe- uh, perspective that like, um, you know, if you're truly spiritual, if you truly have it put together, if you're truly like a really good follower, then you won't need therapy, and that really, people who have uh, mental health challenges, people who have depression, people who suffer from anxiety, or whatever it happens to be, that um, th- the reason that they have those problems is because they're not spiritual enough. Which is like, I don't know if I ever heard that like explicitly said in churches, but I definitely heard like undertones of it or like where it was sort of assumed underneath of what people were saying um, when they talked about therapy. And, you know, some of the effect of that kind of speech and that kind of perspective is that it tends to stigmatize not only mental health conditions, but also going to therapy itself. And so as a pastor, I, you know, routinely ran into people who like, really needed to be, really needed to be in therapy, like, you know, it would really would have benefited them to be able to, like, you know, learn some emotional regulation skills and learn about, you know, setting and respecting boundaries and, you know, just all kinds of stuff like that. Um, but that weren't because in their mind, you know, going to therapy is like what weak people do. So, I tell you all that because, like, this is sort of some of my personal background when it comes to therapy. And, like, um, you know, for a lot of years as a pastor, um, I made it a point to, like, um, you know, tell my churches and tell my people that I was going to therapy because I really wanted to make a you know, an intentional effort at destigmatizing, at pressing back against that, because um, I I totally disagree with those assessments that you know non spiritual people, blah blah blah, that whole thing. Like I I just disagree with that, and I think that it's it's cruel because for a lot of people, therapy is like a lifeline, and it's something that really will enrich their lives if they take advantage of it. Um, and uh, I guess, so, <clears throat> there's this one guy whose work um, is, uh, kind of tries to tie together spirituality and psychology, which, you know, what little I understand of that field is sort of like, almost like seeing like a holy grail, you know? Um, like, uh, you know, if someone can come up with an integrated theory for, um, you know, those two things, they would do really well for themselves, almost like, and, um, so I've been in therapy for a really long time, um, for lots of different sort of reasons. A lot of them had to do with, um, my, uh, trans identity, um, but like in roundabout tangential ways, um, you know, for, for me, um, it felt for many years, it felt like such, uh, there was so much potential loss. I didn't really feel completely comfortable telling therapists that I was struggling with, um, my gender. Um, I, you know, I had one therapist who kind of like, I I expressed that I, you know, was worried that some of what I was feeling was gender dysphoria and they kind of dismiss that, that like, you know, gender dysphoria wasn't totally real or that that was totally ridiculous. And, uh, you know, at the time that felt like a huge relief because I didn't want to have gender dysphoria. It, you know, I wanted to just not be trans at the time. Um, and, 
uh, you know, I've gone through a lot of work of self self acceptance to get to that place. Um, but uh, you know, I've been I saw a therapist probably for the first time in my life um, to work through some PTSD. Um, and I took part in EMDR therapy and really tried to process some traumatic events that I'd went through. Um, uh, I probably have written about it publicly somewhere, but I uh, experienced the loss of my brother when I was 18. He was younger than me, and um, it was traumatic and unexpected, and I was there, and it was... uh, the worst experience, period. It was horrifying. And um, so uh, I was in therapy a little bit later when I was thinking about getting engaged. And my then girlfriend and I, soon to be my fiance, and then very rapidly after that, my wife, we spent some time in premarital therapy with each other with a pastor friend of ours who also had like some kind of counseling background or I don't think that he had like a degree but was sort of known to give counseling or give therapy or whatever. Um, So he spent some time with us, um, just lots of different, you know, opportunities over the year. When, When we had our first child, I had a lot of feelings come up about that, a lot of feelings of anxiety that I worked through. I saw a therapist for a while to help work on um, unhelpful habits of eating. I went through a period um, where I had um, anger that uh, I was not managing constructively. (laughs) Um, And so I went to a therapist to try to adjust how I processed anger so that I wouldn't make uh, decisions that I later regretted. Um, So, I mean, lots of different stuff. And um, I think that there was a period there before I took the job in California where I was depressed and I saw a therapist to work on some of that. And just at lots of points throughout the year, I had a lot of different um, childhood trauma. I have a history of childhood abandonment. So I spent time in therapy working through those things um, and just lots of different stuff. You know, uh, last night I spent some time with some students from a a university on Zoom for their, it was their LGBTQ club. So I got to to spend some time with them and shared about, um, you know, how I actually went to a therapist who tried to help me not be trans anymore um, and to, you know, stop these behaviors that I associated with being trans that I didn't want and that at the time in my religiosity thought was not okay, or at least not okay for me, maybe okay for someone else. So, um, and he ostensibly did reparative therapy type behavioral work with me, um, which uh, didn't work and caused a lot of suffering. Um and uh, so, yeah, so I have, I have a long history <laughs> of being in therapy, all right? That's kind of the long and the short of this. I have a long history of being in therapy, and I highly recommend it. I think it's an important, beautiful, good thing to do. And um, and so, uh, as, a, you know, maybe you're out there and you are a trans person or you're someone who loves a trans person or maybe you're just curious about trans people, and that's why you're listening to me. And if you're thinking about a therapist, I wanted to talk a little bit for about how to choose uh, going to therapy and and why someone might go to therapy, you know, like, um, you know, there's a there was a time where um, trans people, you know, really needed therapists, because therapists were like gatekeepers to be able to access different kinds of treatment. And, And in some places, that's still very much the case, you know, like in order to get on hormone therapy or in order to get on, um, you know, to be able to schedule for a surgery or whatever, you had to have these different kinds of interviews with some kind of therapist or mental health person or psychologist, and they had to give you a formal diagnosis of gender dysphoria before, you know, years ago, it used to be a gender identity disorder, I think, but it was, you know, that diagnosis from a medical professional, that was like 
the way in which services were were um, accessed, you know? And so, like, the gatekeeper is, like, you know, that makes a lot of sense in that case. Like, it really is a gatekeeping kind of thing. And, you know, that still happens in some places. I know that for my, I'm with, uh, I, I'm a member of Kaiser Permanente in Southern California, and I know I had to do some psychological stuff in order to access medical care. Um, but I also know that there's a lot of different places where trans people can get care just on the basis of informed consent. Uh, and I know that there's a large debate about that, but a lot of times trans people, uh, you know, find themselves interacting with the mental health community because of a need for a letter. And, uh, you know, I think more and more there are practitioners out there who are willing to write a letter, you know, even just after having one short conversation, they'll write the letter. And, uh, you know, I think that the reputable ones out there will do that uh, with no or with minimal cost. Um, but, you know, beyond that, uh, beyond accessing a therapist for those reasons, I, you know, I think it's common, especially maybe for for um, trans people who are a little bit further on in their lives, they might access a therapist for, you know, assistance with transition-related challenges or even assistance with sorting out matters of identity. You know, I've, I've um, spent three full episodes so far, and there's more to come asking the question, am I transgender, right? And so just sorting out that simple question, that's a yes or no question, it it can take a lot. And, you know, depending on our personalities and depending on our backgrounds and depending on sort of our, our comfort levels or whatever, some of us may be more comfortable answering that question quickly than others. But for a lot of us who might be like me, um, you know, that was a question that was hard to answer. And it took a lot of thought and time and investigation and intentionality and so on. Um, and so, uh, you know, for me and for a lot of people, working through some of those challenges and questions and issues with a the therapist can be a huge help. Um, so uh, another aspect that I think about with trans people, uh, like I said, assistance with transition, you know, it can be a really, really stressful time in a person's life because there's a need for boundaries. It's stressful. Some relationships end up getting severed, maybe not because we want to. There can be traumatic things that can happen. We can lose our jobs. We can have to switch schools. Like there's all kinds of stuff that can take place and having a therapist to help uh, process those things, to help teach coping skills, to get through them, um, to help identify community resources. You know, these are the sorts of things that therapists are, are really good at and can be helpful at. Um, so, uh, you know, now we're f a few minutes into the episode and I still haven't talked about sort of that question about what to look for with a therapist. Um, so, I'm actually in therapy school, uh, so, you know, at some point in the future, you know, it'll be a couple years, but at, at some point in the future, once I'm licensed, I'm not licensed yet, um, I will be able to see people in, in California or maybe in other states, we'll see. Um, so, I hope to be able to be um, an option for folks down the road, but I'm not there quite yet. I do get to see clients at uh, the my practicum site for school. I'm almost done with school. I have like a semester and a half left, um, but I'm working at the LGBTQ Center of the Desert in Palm Springs, which has a behavioral health uh, center. It's a, it's a community health center, and um, it's been really, really wonderful and amazing, and I've learned a ton about therapy. And obviously, you know, my previous career was nearly 20 years, if you count my work in school, of working as a pastor. And, you know, th therapy and pastoral work are not like polar opposites of each other. You know, they're, I feel like they're in the same or similar conceptual ballparks, right? They, they involve working with people, they involve helping and caring for people. There's obviously different uh, types of expertise that goes into them and different 
professional settings and a different process to be involved and certainly different skills. Um, but, but there are some similarities, you know, it's not like I went into, you know, sanitation engineering or something, which, which would be, you know, a totally different field. <clears throat> um, so I'm in therapy school right now. And so these are a few things that, that, how I would answer the question now as someone who's been on this side of it, uh, of how to choose a therapist. Um, you know, uh, first, uh, you know, when you're in therapy school and when you're sort of beginning to work with clients, um, we're, we're kind of taught to sort of navigate, uh, well, actually, I want to step back one step before we go there. Um, there are different types of therapists. There are different kinds of professional paths to becoming a therapist or to become a counselor, to become a mental health uh, worker. And at least in California, I know that there are at least several. You could be a psychiatrist, right, which is a, um, a medical doctor who's done their residency in psychiatry. And so... Um, there are some psychiatrists who do talk therapy um, in addition to um, medication management and, you know, med prescribing medicines. Um, but it, from what I understand of psychiatry, it tends to be m more in the sphere of medication management. Um, and, and similarly, there are some nurse practitioners that do psychiatry. There might be some uh, physician assistants that do psychiatry, but that's all kind of like in the medical you know, wing of things. And there's also like clinical psychologists, uh, some of which I'm, I'm losing track of my fingers here. Uh, there, there's clinical psychologists who um, also d tend to have um, a doctoral degree, a PhD or a um, doctor of psychology. And um, they, some of them can, you know, prescribe medications, but a lot of times they are working in inpatient um you know, settings, uh, people that have, uh, working with folks that have, you know, pretty severe um, mental illnesses or different challenges or some kind of live-in type programs or recovery programs and so on. Um, so there's, you know, s clinical psychologists. And then there's um, LPCC, which is Licensed Practical Counselor, Licensed, licensed Professional community counselor. I don't know what the, th anyway, LPCC. So that's, um, that's a, a different track yet where you go through and get your, you know, master's degree to do counseling. And that's, um, th that tends to be, you know, uh, a pretty, um, that tends to be a, a, an approach that's taken, like if you're going to do um, rehab type counseling, or you're, you're working with folks who are um, trying to get off of, um, trying to get out of a drug or alcohol addiction. Um, again, it, it, you may end up working in different kinds of settings like a group home or, a, a, you know, even alongside, you know, um, clinical psychologists. Um, but also <clears throat> in working with individuals in, you know, counseling, individual counseling settings or private practice settings. Um, uh, or community behavioral health clinics like the one I'm working at. And then, and finally, uh, the path that I'm going, or actually not finally, uh, then the path that I'm going down, which is a Master of Arts in Marriage and Family Therapy. So this is a, a an approach to um, talk therapy or mental health therapy that is, uh, that takes a systems approach. It's a systemic model. And so, um, as opposed to a more uh, psychological focus, which, um, you know, like the other fields that I just mentioned might lean more toward. I don't think any field is truly, you know, anti-systemic thinking, but marriage and family therapy is very intentionally systemic thinking. And so we, in, in my field, um, we will do the same kind of work, like we'll sit and do counseling and therapy with people, but we will very intentionally try to look at what is the context this person is in and, you know, what are the structural things that are going on? What are the cultural, um, socioeconomic things that are going on? Are there medical challenges that are affecting this person? We really try to take a holistic look at their whole lives 
and use interventions uh, in session and outside of session to help shift so that um, not only the symptoms are reduced, but also the root of the problem. Um, uh, finally, there are social workers. So you can get a Master's of Arts in, or a Master of Science in social work, um, and then you can get like a counseling or therapy sort of, it's almost like a certificate or certification that gets added on to that. And so there's a lot of social workers out there who um, are also therapists and they're licensed to do that. I've had those folks in my life before, actually. And if I think about my, you know, my current workplace, uh, we have uh, licensed, we have social workers who are working as therapists. We have, um, else, uh, we have, um, LMFTs, so that's what my field, licensed marriage and family therapists. We have clinical psychologists. We have LPCCs. We don't have any um, psychiatrists or, or nurse practitioner psychiatrists, but all the other types we have at our therapy uh, at our clinic. And we all kind of work together and do our thing. And so as you're looking for a therapist, you're going to run across potentially all of those different options. And um, it can be a little bit confusing, and I also think that it's entirely possible for any of those uh, types, you know, profession types to provide really good therapy for you. Um, but also, I think it's important to pay attention to the fact that their, you know, their training and their education and, the, and their experience may influence the type of therapy or the flavor of therapy that they are able or willing to uh, provide, you know. And obviously, I chose to pursue the marriage and family therapy route because it's the best. And um, I say that with, you know, tongue in cheek. But, you know, we, we all like the field that we chose and we all chose the field that we did. Um, so I if I was looking for a therapist, I would pay attention to that, and I would tend to gravitate toward a marriage and family therapist um, for those reasons that I mentioned, the relational quality. Um, but like I said, I've also had really good experiences with um, licensed therapists who were also social workers who, you know, in a lot of other, you know, in a lot of ways, will carry with them those same um, or, or similar systemic perspectives. Um, I, I think another thing to uh, do when you're looking for a therapist is to try to have a conversation with them before the first appointment, or if not, to think of the first appoint appointment as an opportunity to interview them, as well as them interviewing, uh, interviewing you. Now, it's a little tough in today's world and in today's economy because um, there's a shortage of therapists and we really, we really need more therapists and we don't have enough. And so it, it may feel like it's hard to be choosy or it's hard to, you know, really find the perfect fit. And you may feel like you're just stuck with the one you're stuck with. And, and there may be some truth to that. So I don't want to, you know, blow smoke, um, at you. Um, but, in an ideal world, I would see that first appointment or that first phone call. A lot of times when I have new clients, I like to actually call them for a few minutes before the first appointment even happens just to ask them about uh, what their concerns are and what the things are that they really want to work on um, to kind of get that connection going. Um, but, uh, you know, th there's a big chunk of therapy that just has to do with interpersonal connection. And like, do I vibe with this person? And do I trust this person? In the field, we call it therapeutic rapport. And, you know, the way that we assess that is really through our gut, you know, like, just how do you feel about like, are you connected to this person? Do you feel like, you know, do you feel like they're listening to you? Do you feel like they care about you? Do you feel like they're paying attention to you? Do you feel like they're, you know, taking into account the complexities that are going on in your life? Do they, uh, do you feel like they're trying to fit you into a, you know, into a round hole if you're a square peg, you know? Um, so I would say pay attention to those interpersonal things like do does do I have, you know, do I vibe with this person or not? 
Um, but at the same time, I also think that um, uh, a good therapist will respond uh, positively, and I mean, like, will respond in a way, maybe not necessarily agree with, but like, will have a conversation about, you know, feedback and preferences and, you know, criticism and so on. Um, but also, I would caution that, like, if, if you feel like you're not vibing immediately with a therapist, that that doesn't mean that the cause is, like, totally lost, you know? Sometimes it takes a few sessions to really kind of begin to understand each other and to begin um, building uh, some trust. Uh, so, you know, I kind of feel like it goes both ways a little bit when you're choosing a therapist like do they pass the vibe test yes or no but also like maybe be patient with the vibe test and you know if you have a a therapist who's repeatedly not passing the vibe test like it might be worth trusting that gut instinct Um, but also if you have a therapist who like doesn't pass the vibe test one time but then you know, it starts to seem to work a little bit later on. It may be that that the overall vibe, which is sort of the overall picture, is worth trusting. And maybe that first impression just wasn't the perfect one. Um, so, uh, you know, that's th- those are some of the things, you, you know, you could do a deep dive into therapeutic model, um, you know, the model that they're using. Uh, you know, for for a trans person wishing to do gender exploration, um, I I would feel pretty doubtful that like a behavioral approach. So that would you know a lot of times you would see a person does CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy. I have my doubts that an approach like that would um, provide the best tools for someone who's wanting to explore their gender. Um, but you know, if if it's a trans person who is you know, experiencing symptoms of depression, um, CBT could be a really helpful option. You know, a a lot of times CBT is sort of like a basic level that we start at with folks. Um, It teaches, you know, kind of basic emotional regulation skills. It teaches the connection between how we feel and what we're doing and what we're thinking. It teaches us how to stop and challenge our own unhelpful thoughts. It's a really, really great model Um, and it also is not necessarily one that goes really deep into our psyche. Um, you know, I I think that, uh, a more client centered model like, um, narrative therapy or internal family systems therapy, uh, or, you know, even like, uh, you know, a, a problem solving type therapy, solution focused therapy, um, might be more useful for a trans person wanting to go through the process of, um, you know, identity exploration, because those tend to be, those ones I just mentioned, those approaches might tend to be more um, client focused and client driven and client defined. Um, I think that there's a lot of people who might naturally gravitate toward uh, someone who shares uh, demographic markers with them. Um, You know, there's been some studies done that show that um, uh, African-American people tend to have better therapeutic outcomes if they have therapists who are African-American. And part of that has to do with, um, you know, a mutual understanding of perspectives, um, maybe an increased sense of trust, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, you know, I, I'm not aware of, you know, wide scale studies that show that like, you know, the outcomes are better if your identity markers match your therapist. But it makes sense to me why someone would have the impulse that like, well, if I'm trans, I want a trans therapist. Or if I'm you know, Latina, I want a Latina therapist, or if I'm lesbian, I want a lesbian therapist, and so on, you know. Um, And that impulse makes sense, but I'm not completely convinced that it's, um, you know, an absolute prerequisite or that you would have to have that in order to have a good relationship. Um, You know, I certainly, you know, like with the therapist that I had who kind of minimized the existence of trans identity, you know, that wasn't super helpful at the time, although it wasn't something I really wanted to be honest about at the time anyway. 
nevertheless, that was a, you know, a cis white male person and uh, ostensibly with very little experience about, you know, gender expansive experience or reality. And so, you know, I don't know if, well, I, I guess I can only sort of assume that, that that person's intersecting identities led them to have that perspective. And I, and I would highly doubt a trans person would ignore a question like that in the same way. Um, you know, one of the problems that you probably will find if you are a trans person, you're looking for a trans therapist is that there are even fewer trans therapists than there are therapists. Like, um, I, I don't think that there's a ton of us out there. I, I know that we're out there. I actually worked with a trans person who was a therapist, uh, for quite a while, um, who, uh, didn't do therapy with me, but did kind of this informal coaching process as I was going through, um, process of coming out and the process of transitioning. And it was incredibly helpful. Um, and I had to, um, just, I think that I grew out of the need for that, but also I needed to be in therapy with, uh, like proper therapy with a fully licensed person in my state, uh, for school. So I, I kind of switched over for that reason. Um, but you know, when I chose my current therapist, you know, there was a website and I went through and read descriptions and the one that I chose, I chose the one that looked the most queer, Honestly, you know, like, I, tr- I mean, they uh, had a statement of, you know, enthusiastic affirmation about queer people. They had some social media stuff that resonated about, you know, body uh, positivity and health. And, um, you know, they seemed like that they were a mover and a shaker and a doer. Um, it turns out they were queer themselves and were all of those things. And it's been a really, really wonderful match. So, you know, that's how I went about choosing it. Um, and it worked out well, but you know, it doesn't, I know it doesn't always work out that way. Um, you know, in terms of physical resources, there's lots of searches you can do online. You know, you can go to like psychology.com or whatever. Um, you know, that what I did was my, uh, you know, Kaiser assigned me to this, um, you know, counseling, behavioral health uh, organization that provided counseling. They referred me out to them. And so I went on their website. They had a catalog of all their people. And I looked through. I found a couple that looked appealing to me. Um, the one that I ended up with is was one of those. And like I said, I, I searched for them. I looked for their, you know, marketing stuff. I looked to see if they had a website and so on. Like, I have a website, so I'm kind of nerdy like that. Um, and that's how I made the decision. Um, I, I uh, you know, there was a time in my life where I was going to therapy um, and trying to work on some really sensitive stuff that was sort of, you know, tangential to my gender. Um and it was really important to me that I had a therapist who was not a member of one of my churches or my denomination. And I found someone who was married to um, an Adventist, but wasn't an Adventist themselves, which for me at the time, this was, you know, maybe 15 years ago or something. Um, for me at the time, that was perfect because they understood the distinct Adventist subculture, but were not part of it themselves. And so that worked out well. So, you know, there can be all kinds of different priorities. Um, you know, if you're in a local area and you have, you know, like say like a PPO type insurance that will just pay you uh, or pay up, you know, pay for the therapist of your choice. Um, and you're going to try to find someone locally. Uh, I honestly, I would ask around, I would ask in the queer community, you know, are there therapists that you recommend? Um, if you happen to be friends with a therapist who you trust, I would ask them, Hey, are there people that you, uh, hear good things about? You know, I wouldn't tie myself in. I wouldn't like tie myself down to a specific person by asking that question. You know, sometimes you might feel obligated, um, to go in a certain direction if you're asking a friend for their advice. But, you know, if there's a way you can ask it broad enough of like, hey, I'm trying to like sort out my options and kind of see what's out there on the table. Have you, you know, is there anyone you know of? 
um, you know, word of mouth can be really helpful. Um, and especially if there are people who, you know, who are in your life, who share your values and who have similar perspectives as you, or maybe you've gone through similar experiences than you, and they say, yes, this therapist is really great. Um, that can be super helpful in, in sort of, you know, picking through the sea of options. Um, and, you know, just as an aside, I don't think that it's contraindicated or inappropriate at all for me and my friend to both be seeing the same therapist. You know, as therapists, we keep everything confidential. So we're not going to be talking to, to anyone about you. I mean, as therapists, we do sometimes um, uh, take our cases to a group of colleagues to talk about what's going on and what are the issues that person is facing and what are the symptoms that are coming up to ask for advice and feedback. Um, we call it consultation. And in fact, in in seeking for, uh, and, and th- I guess the point was that all of that is very highly protected and considered, you know, fully, completely confidential. And a lot of times when a therapist brings a case for consultation, they give no identifying information. So they just describe the case very generically and then feedback is given generically as well. Um, But actually that, you know, if I had an opportunity to interview a therapist, that would be one pretty granular um, question I would ask. And if, you know, and if there was a litmus test for me, which really there isn't, and I don't really recommend you to have a litmus test, but if there was, I would ask a therapist, uh, what do you do for case consultation? You know, how often are you consulting with other therapists? Who are these other therapists? Is it on a regular basis? Are you, you know, how are you in community? How are you supervised? How are you... Um, you know, continuing to grow and to learn, Uh, you know, what are the books that you read most recently that you've most valued? What are the um, theoretical underpinnings that you uh, most gravitate to um, or or toward? Uh, What philosophically has influenced you the most? These are the types of questions that I think are really important to me, but especially the case consultation question. And, you know, if I was seeking for a therapist and that therapist told me, oh, I never consult with anyone because I know better than anyone else. Um, I would probably run away. You know, that would be a big red flag for me. Um, because I think that that may indicate that that therapist has a, a, a bone to pick or they have a really big ego or a really fragile ego Um, And also may indicate that they're not fully equipped in the present, in the current moment to, um, uh, like, manage or to to give, like, best practice, to give current care, you know, if they're not in consultation, if they did their, you know, degree 30 years ago and they never talked to anyone in the field, that, you know, that might worry me. Um you know, I would want to verify that a counselor is actually licensed. They actually have the degree and the license that they claim. There's a lot of pastors who claim to be therapists or who claim to be counselors who are, you know, probably good people and probably mean well, but who don't have full licensure. Um, And I would be really leery of um, going to a pastor for, for, counseling. You know, when I was in seminary, we were taught very explicitly that offering counseling more than once or twice for a church member um, was far outside of our scope of practice and far outside of our expertise, and that we needed to refer people on. And I know for a fact that there have been, you know, pastors who have been uh, challenged legally because of providing, you know, therapy services that they were not qualified for. But more often, um, I think that there are people who are harmed um, by that, you know, well-intentioned but effectively 
incompetent work. Um, so I would make sure whoever you're thinking about working with actually has a license to do what they're doing. Um, that may seem really basic, but you can look up their, you know, licensure information on your government site. You know, here in California, it's called the BBS, the Bureau of Behavioral Services or something like that, BBS. Um, but you can look up and see if a person is licensed or if they're suspended or if they've had any kind of, you know, legal action against them or whatever. Like, you can see that, and I would uh, recommend it. Um, I feel like <clears throat> at this point I'm rambling on and on and on, um, but uh, that's that's L and that's me, and I've been talking about um, finding a therapist, uh, something that I highly recommend and that I think is really valuable. So uh, blessings to you in your search. Um, I hope that you find the perfect one um, that can help you out in your journey along the way, or that, you know, by listening to me, you're like, oh, wow, I need to get myself a therapist. I need to go after this because uh, I think it's going to really help you. So um, thanks so much for listening. Thanks for your feedback, uh, your your uh, constructive feedback, that is. Um, send me an email at twatpodcasting at gmail.com. Uh, rate and review the show. That would be wonderful. Um, I'm continuing to put these episodes up on YouTube. Um, I don't know how long I'll continue to do that. Uh, it doesn't seem like there's a great deal of interest on YouTube, and it is uh, quite a bit of work to um, add that into the mix, but uh, we will see. Um, but thanks so much, uh, as always, for listening. And uh, once again, this is L, and I am a transgender woman talking.